Hello everyone, I welcome you all to Physics Wala and in this session we are going to discuss the next portion of our very interesting portion of organic chemistry which is nothing but the purification of organic compounds. Now in the previous session we were discussing about the purification of the organic compounds which was already completed. So there are different type of techniques for the purification of organic compound depending upon the properties of your organic compound as well as the impurities. Now, if I talk about the next part, if you have purified the organic compound, the next task for you is the uh, is to check the presence of a different type of heteroatoms as well as the amount of hydrocarbon which is already present in the organic compound. If I talk about the first part, there are two sections. First one is known as the qualitative analysis and next one is actually known as the quantitative analysis. Qualitative analysis simply means you are talking about the quality detection. What type of atoms are actually present? Is there any specific group? Is there any specific element which is present in the hydrocarbon? How to check that particular part? So we have different type of uh, reagents, I can say, which shows a color change or which shows a different type of a product formation with the help of that particular compound. Now always remember that the entire part of qualitative as well as quantitative analysis actually works on the principle that first of all, you have to convert whatever hydrocarbon you have because in hydrocarbons the main part is chemical uh, covalent bonding but for the detection of the entire part you have to use the entire concept of salt analysis so you need to create the entire part into ionic compounds so that you can detect the presence of different type of ions which might be producing just because of the presence of that particular uh, atom i can say so first ask in case of qualitative analysis you have to check the quality of the particular ion which is present with the help of different type of tests next part if you have performed all the tests uh, related to the uh, qualitative analysis now you have to check how much amount of that particular part is present which comes under the category of a quantitative analysis where you talk about the quantity analysis in case of organic compound trust me the entire portion is going to be very very interesting and very easy so what are the portions which we are going to cover in this session first of all we are going to talk about the Lazine's test it's a very important test for the qualitative analysis then we are going to talk about the qualitative estimation what type of techniques we can, we are going to use for the qualitative analysis next part will be quantitative analysis where we are going to deal with the numerical portion and last part will be definitely the question analysis okay so first of all we have to create a solution which is known as Lazine's test. I told you that uh, in, in that particular case, whatever organic compound you have, the main type of bonding in case of organic compound is covalent bonding, which is formed by the sharing of electron. So you have to actually create an environment so that the entire covalent compound can be converted into ionic compounds. And for that, the main test is basically known as the Lazine's test. What happens in that particular case? Uh, it's a very easy analysis. First of all, the detection of nitrogen, sulfur, halogens, as well as a phosphorus, which might be present in the organic compound, are detected with the help of that particular test, which is known as Lazine's test. So basically, the elements which are present in that particular compound are first of all are going to be converted from covalent form into the ionic form by a simple type of reaction that you have to fuse the entire part of organic compound with the sodium. It means you have to put a small amount of organic compound along with a small, uh, I can say, portion of a sodium and you have to heat the entire part. Eventually, after strong heating, after red hot heating, you have to actually convert or you have to use water to convert the entire part into ionic form. So that part corresponds to Lazine's test. We are going to discuss about the preparation method also. But first of all, what I'm saying that basically, if I talk about the analysis in hydrocarbons, definitely carbon is going to be present. If in an organic compound, nitrogen is also present that can be easily converted into ionic form. So sodium when combines with carbon, as well as nitrogen. These two parts are coming from the hydrocarbon or derivative of hydrocarbon. They are going to be converted into NaCN. Now you have the presence of Na positive as well as a Cn negative ion. It means the entire part is now converted into ionic form. For example, we have sulfur. Again, after fusion, it's going to be converted into Na2S. It means now you have Na positive as well as sulfide ion, which is S2 negative. Along with that, let's say we have an organic compound in which halide ion is also present. Halogen is also present. So definitely it's going to be converted into NaX. It means we have 
एन ए पॉजिटिव प्लस एक्स नेगेटिव सो दर्स्ट टास्क इज टू कन्वर्ट दोवेलेंटली बॉन्डेड कंपाउंड इन टू आइनिक फॉर्म सो दैट वी कैन परफॉर्म ऑल दी टेस्ट फॉर दी क्वालिटेटिव एनालिसिस बिकॉज दिस एंटायर पार्ट डिपेंड्स अपॉन द प्रोसेस विच इज नोन एज अ सॉल्ट एनालिसिस ऑल दी प्रिंसिपल्स आर रिलेटेड टू सॉल्ट एनालिस पास विच कम्स अंडर दी कैटेगरी ऑफ इनऑर्गेनिक केमिस्ट्री ओके सो इट्स अ मिक्सचर ऑफ आई कैन से इनऑर्गेनिक एज वेल एज ऑर्गेनिक केमिस्ट्री now carbon nitrogen sulfur or any type of halogen they are coming from definitely organic compounds what happens that cyanide sulfide and halide of a sodium are eventually going to be formed on sodium fusion and they are extracted from the fused masses by boiling it with distilled water because they are water soluble in nature definitely they are going to come in the aqueous solution and you can filter out the entire part and eventually you can form a extract which is known as sodium fusion extract so all the test which are going to be performed for qualitative analysis the first task is to create sodium fusion extract i hope this entire part is clear i hope this entire part is clear it's a very interesting and indeed a very simple process you just have to remember certain test and how we are going to deal with the entire part <clears throat> now if i talk about the first of all what is sodium fusion extract let's try to uh, understand what we are going to do in that en entire process because if the first step is clear rest of the processes you have to use a specific reagent and detect the presence of that particular ion <clears throat> so take a small piece of dry sodium in a fusion tube fusion tube is a very small tube which is a glass tube it's like a test tube you can say but very small type of uh, test tube now heat the tube slightly on a bunsen burner so that the sodium melts to a shiny globule so first of all you have to uh, heat the entire part slightly so that the sodium can actually convert it into a globule type structure what happens then add a pinch of organic compound now in the heating process the organic compound which contains uh, carbon nitrogen sulfur or any type of halogen they immediately at that high temperature they are going to react with the sodium globule now what happens heat it slowly to start with so that the compound reacts with the sodium metal so everything is actually we are doing everything to react the entire compound with sodium only and eventually now heat the tube strongly till it becomes red hot it means that you have uh, actually created such an environment where the energy is a very very high definitely all the bonds are going to break down which are covalent bond and eventually they are going to react with the sodium sodium has the tendency to release the electron at that high temperature and eventually these elements which are either x or nitrogen or sulfur they are going to actually capture that particular uh, electron to convert the entire part into ionic formation plunge the red hot tube into a china dish containing distilled water so you have to break down that uh, particular uh, tube uh, which is a very small fine tube and you can see that entire part is going to be dissolved in the distilled water because they now converted into ionic form they can be easily dissolved in water and last part in that case is you have to filter out the entire part okay so you stop heating and remove the insoluble matter after filtration and last you are going to get the filtrate which is known as sodium fusion extract or also known as lazines extract i hope the first part is clear to everyone that is the process of lazines test okay so this is the first step now what happens after that we have to detect the presence of different type of moieties which are actually present in the hydrocarbon there might be a presence of nitrogen there might be a presence of halide ion there might be a presence of sulfur or i can say there might be a presence of phosphorus so we have to use a specific type of test to detect the presence of these entire portion okay now if i talk about the first part which is the test for nitrogen <coughs> always remember if the nitrogen is present definitely it's going to combine with carbon to convert the entire part into cyanide ion so you have to detect the presence of a cyanide ion by any means if you are able to detect the presence of cyanide ion you can say carbon which is coming from the organic compound and nitrogen which is the hetero atom already uh, present in the organic compound can be easily detected and the test for that part is very very easy what happens the sodium fusion extract is actually going to be boiled with a particular solution which is iron sulfate ferrous sulfate feso4 and then it's going to be acidified with concentrated sulfuric acid because the entire reaction is going to occur in the acidic medium so this is the first portion this is the first portion 
Now, in that case, when eventually you are going to mix the entire part, there might be a chance <coughs> that there is a formation of Prussian blue color takes place, which shows the presence of nitrogen in the organic compound. Prussian blue complex is a highly, highly specific complex, which is only going to be present when we are going to combine Fe3 positive ion with a ferrocyanide ion. So that combination actually confirms the presence of a nitrogen. What happens in the reaction? Let me tell you. So basically what happens? First of all, we are taking, we are taking Fe2 positive from uh, iron sulfate. It's going to be reacted with Cn negative to convert the entire part into FeCn6 4 negative. Initially, you have started the entire reaction with sodium. So definitely you can say that reaction should be NaCn when reacts with FeSO4. Eventually, the main ion is this Fe as well as Cn. So they are going to combine with each other to form FeCn6. And it's going to look like Na4 FeCn6. Rest part is Na2. SO4. It's not going to hinder with the reaction because it's only the spectator ion. It's not going to react with anything. So we are starting with uh, uh, 6 NaCN I can say and it's going to be reacted with FeSO4 to eventually form sodium ferrocyanate. What happens when this is sodium ferrocyanate comes in presence of Fe3 positive which we are again taking in the solution. This entire part is going to be converted into a very specific complex which is known as a ferry ferrocyanide. This entire part is ferry ferrocyanide. It's nothing but a coordinate complex. You can say it's a coordination complex which is going to be formed between Fe. Uh, 3 positive as well as the entire part of FeCN. Reaction is very easy. So you have Fe 3 positive, you have FeCN whole 6, 4 negative. So just try to cross multiply the entire part. You will get Fe 4, FeCN 6 thrice. Why I am using ferry ferrocyanide? Because the outer iron is present in a plus 3 oxidation state which is a ferric part. Next part is inner uh, iron is present in plus 2 oxidation state which is uh, denoted as a ferro. So the entire complex becomes a fairy ferrocyanide and it has a very specific color which is a Prussian blue color. Very specific blue coloration which confirms the presence of a Cn negative ion. I hope this entire part is clear. Just have a look. Just have a look at it. So the first part is clear that we can detect the presence of nitrogen by simply converting into cyanide ion and then reacting it with Fe3 positive solution. So eventually it's going to be converted into ferry ferrocyanide which has a specific color which is uh, Prussian blue color. Now in the same way if I talk about the presence of sulfur same type of test we can use but the reagent might be different in this particular case. What happens that uh, eventually we have S2 negative, it's going to be reacted with Na2 positive and it converts into Na2S. Now I have the organic compound. It means I have the ion in aqua solution, I have the S2 negative part. If I add Pb2 positive aqua solution, it means the sodium fusion extract first of all is going to be acidified with acetic acid because the entire reaction uh, is going to occur in the acidic medium. First of all, what happens? that if you are using Na2S with acidic solution, eventually you can form H2S. You can form H2S. Now what happens, this H2S has a specific tendency to react with the Pb2 positive. So in a solution, if I'm adding lead acetate, if I'm adding lead acetate, which is nothing but Pb CH3 COO twice. It means I have a Pb Two positive, it's going to combine with S2 negative. And they are going to form a complex which is known as a PBS. And it has a specific color which is a black color which confirms that the presence of a sulfur is already there. Because the PBS is uh, black in color. So this entire test, if you remember the exact part of, uh, I can say, salt analysis. 
दिस इज अ ग्रुप टू कैटाइन विच अगेन कैन बी डिटेक्टेड विद द हेल्प ऑफ एच टू एस इन प्रेजेंस ऑफ एसिडिक मीडियम सो रिएक्शन इज एक्जैक्टली सेम इफ यू वॉन्ट टू एक्चुअली चेक द प्रेजेंस ऑफ सल्फाइड आयन देन यू कैन यूज द पीवी टू पॉजिटिव इफ यू वॉन्ट टू चेक द प्रेजेंस ऑफ पीवी टू पॉजिटिव यू कैन एक्चुअली यूज एच टू एस इन द एसिडिक मीडियम इवेंचुअली बोथ दी स्पीशीज आर गोइंग टू फॉर्म पीवीएस विच इज ब्लैक इन कलर आई होप दिस एंटायर पार्ट इज क्लियर इट्स अ वेरी इजी टेस्ट फॉर द डिटेक्शन ऑफ सल्फर now <coughs> there is one more test because uh, there might be a chance that other ions are also present and they are going to hinder with that part so i need a confirmatory test for that part i am going to use a specific solution which is known as sodium nitroprusside it's not a prussian blue it's a sodium nitroprusside which is nothing so you are going to use na2 fecn5no and eventually after the reaction this entire part is going to react with this complex and it's going to form fecn5nos4 negative or you can say that it's going to form na4 fecn5nos now this entire part is actually violet in color it's violet in color so the formation of a violet color formation basically if there is a presence of a violet color which indicates the presence of a sulfur it's a confirmatory test so first part you can use a preliminary test which is nothing but pbs uh, black coloration or you can use a confirmatory test which is nothing but the uh, presence of a violet coloration in presence of sodium nitroprusside i hope the second part is also clear so there are two things which you can do for sulfide ion okay now let's talk about the next part there might be a chance that both uh, nitrogen and sulfur are present in the organic compound so eventually if you heat the entire part they are going to be converted into scn thiocyanate they are going to be converted into scn negative now either you can check the presence of direct part which is scn or you can actually detect the presence of nitrogen in separate vessel and sulfur in separate vessel what happens first of all if you are going to combine the entire part you just have to add a freshly prepared solution of fe3 positive if this fe3 positive is going to combine with the thiocyanate it's going to produce a blood red coloration which talks about the presence of scn only okay so sodium sodium thio, uh, thiocyanate is formed eventually in the first part of uh, sodium fusion extract then it gives a uh, blood red color and no prussian blue color since there are no free cyanide ions because sulfur is present it's not going to release the cn negative which shows the test for the uh, night uh, you can say uh, prussian blue coloration so now the cyanide is not free it's combined with sulfur it becomes thiocyanate so you can detect the presence of thiocyanate separately by reacting it with only freshly prepared fe3 positive solution it's going to be freshly prepared okay so the reaction is very easy now if you want to separate the entire part you just have to heat the uh, entire portion very strongly in excess amount of sodium so that you can create cn negative different and s2 negative in a different chamber what happens if the sodium fusion extract is carried out or the entire experiment is carried out with excess of sodium and you are going to eventually heat the entire part now this thiocyanate whatever is formed in the presence of excess of sodium it's going to be converted into nacn as well as na2s in aqueous solution now you have a free cn negative ion as well as a free s2 negative ion and you can actually talk about the entire part with same experiment which is a prussian blue complex and in this case you can detect the presence with nitroprusside okay so that will be violet color formation now you can perform both the two test uh, which we were discussing earlier so you can actually do that particular part i hope this portion is clear so this is on the only case when you have the presence of nitrogen and sulfur uh directly in the organic compound 
So you have to either perform the detection of SCN negative ion, which can be done by reacting it with acidified Fe3 positive solution, or you can eventually break down the entire part in excess of sodium to convert cyanide ion differently and sulfide ion differently and perform two tests for the entire part. I hope this entire portion is clear. It's a very interesting phenomena related to the qualitative analysis. Now for the uh, qualitative analysis of halogen, the rest of the part is very easy. So eventually when sodium is going to react with this X, it's going to form NAX. Okay. Again, you have to acidify the entire part because in acidic solution, you are going to free this X negative ion. It's going to be X negative. Now you can detect the presence of this X negative. What happens? The sodium fusion extract is acidified with a nitric acid and then treated with silver nitrate. Why we are using this acidified nitric acid solution? Because if carbon and hydrogen both are present, let's say carbon is present as well as hydrogen is present, which are coming from the hydrocarbon. So in the presence of HNO3, this HNO3 is a good oxidizing agent. It's a good oxidizing agent. What happens? Eventually, this carbon is going to be converted into CO2 and you can remove that particular part. And this water can be, uh, hydrogen can be converted into water, which is not going to interfere with the reaction. And eventually, you will left with only X negative ion. So what do you have to do? In the case of X negative ion, you can add a freshly prepared AgNO3 aqueous solution. When this AgNO3 is going to react with the X negative, it immediately forms AgX PPT. And how you are going to detect that particular part? Because X can be uh, Cl negative, it can be Br negative or it can be I negative. We can never detect F negative in this particular case. Because the aqueous solution of AgF is uh, water soluble, it's not going to form any type of PPT. So we can always use only Cl negative Br negative as well as I negative. I hope this entire part is clear. So what happens in this particular case? If you have AgCl, it is actually white colored PPT. If you have AgBr, it's going to be a slightly pale yellow PPT. And if you have AgI, it's going to be yellow colored PPT. So that you can easily differentiate which type of moiety is actually present in the organic compound. I hope this entire part is clear. I hope this entire part is clear. Now, a wide PPT, again, how can I cross verify that whatever PPT is formed is basically of AgCl only. So, first of all, we have AgCl, which is a white PPT. So, when this entire part is reacted with aqueous solution of ammonia, which is a weak base, this entire part is going to be dissolved. So you can say, because eventually it's going to form a complex, which is Ag, NH3 twice, and then you have a Cl. It's a soluble complex. It's a soluble complex. So this is the second step. If you have the white PPT, you just have to add the aqueous solution of ammonia. It's going to be dissolved. It's going to be soluble because eventually it's going to form a particular complex. And that's how you can detect that AgCl is present. Let's say there might be a chance that we have AgBr. What happens in this particular case? First of all, this PPT is slightly pale yellow. Very light yellow color. If you add aqua solution of ammonia which is a dilute which is dilute you can start with the dilute solution you can start with the dilute solution first of all it's going to be partial soluble it's partially soluble okay eventually what happens if you are using this agbr which is pale yellow with a concentrated aqueous nh3 now it becomes soluble, which shows the presence of AgBr in the solution. I hope this part is clear. I hope this part is clear. And what happens? What happens? Let's say you have AgI. You have AgI, which is yellow in color, which is yellow in color. And when you add dilute solution of 
एक्वस अमोनिया इट इज नॉट सोल्यूबल नॉट एट ऑल सोल्यूबल बट इफ आई एम एडिंग कॉन्सेंट्रेटेड एक्वस सोल्यूशन ऑफ अमोनिया नाउ इट बिकम्स पार्शियली सोल्यूबल विच शोज द प्रेजेंस ऑफ ए जी आई इन द मिक्सर एंड दैट्स हाउ यू कैन डिफ्रेंशिएट बिटवीन दीज थ्री पार्ट जस्ट नोट डाउन दिस इंपॉर्टेंट पॉइंट I hope this part is clear. A very interesting portion and indeed a very easy portion. You can say. So if you know the salt analysis from inorganic chemistry, uh, it's very easy to understand the entire part because most of the reactions in case of uh, this organic uh, analysis of uh, elements, I can say qual qualitative analysis, as well as cation anion radical analysis, which is present in the inorganic chemistry, they are almost same. They are literally almost same. So if you know these two things, you can correlate with the entire part. Okay. now if i talk about the next part which actually corresponds to nitrogen and sulfur if both nitrogen and sulfur are also present along with halogen so definitely they are going to interfere with the reaction because if nitrogen is present definitely it's going to form cn negative if sulfur is form, uh, is present it's going to form s2 negative and eventually when both the things are going to combine there might be a chance that we have the presence of scn negative if these ions are present they have a tendency to react with ag positive which we are using in the initial phase and they are going to form white color ppt so you are going to be very confused that the ppt is of agx or with agcn or ag2s or agscn so first of all we have to remove this entire part so it's a very important point it's a very important point what happens if nitrogen or sulfur is also present in the compound then sodium fusion extract is first boiled with concentrated nitric acid so that i can decompose these entire part so this uh, uh, nitric acid which is a very good oxidizing agent is going to decompose cyanide or sulfide of a sodium formed during the lazeins test and these ions would otherwise interfere with the silver nitrate test i hope this entire portion is clear to everyone so you just have to remove the entire part by simply boiling the entire mixture with concentrated hno3 which is a very good oxidizing agent because it's not going to react with x negative but they are going to convert this uh, cn negative or s2 negative into their corresponding states either it's going to be converted into so4 two negative and these carbon and nitrogen both eventually are going to break down so they are not going to interfere with the test of ag positive i hope this part is clear now if i talk about the test for phosphorus this test is highly highly specific and only used to detect the presence of a phosphorus only what happens the compound which is heated with an oxidizing agent which is sodium peroxide so first of all you have you have any positive sodium is there and you have a phosphorus so first of all we are starting with na as well as p which is present in the organic compound now i am using an oxidizing agent so that i can convert this phosphorus into po4 3 negative so that i can convert the entire part into phosphate ion so we are going to use an oxidizing agent and generally this oxidizing agent is nothing but h2o2 i hope this part is clear i hope this part is clear now the phosphorus present in the compound is oxidized to phosphate ion and <clears throat> if we have h positive eventually it's going to form h3 po4 it's going to be converted into corresponding acid which is h3po4 the solution boiled with nitric acid because we are using nitric acid now we have the presence of h positive na from nitric acid so the entire part is going to be converted into h3po4 now it's actually going to be treated with ammonium molybdate and this reaction is a highly highly specific what happens you can see this reaction that na3po4 plus hno3 is going to be converted into h3po4 and nano3 it's not going to be interfere with the reaction now the entire part is going to be reacted with ammonium molybdate and it's going to produce a canary 
yellow PPT. It's going to produce a canary yellow PPT. It's a very specific color. You must have seen that color in, I can say, it's basically used in a flower, which which is generally used in the in the Saraswati Puja. I'm not sure that in Hindi that that flower is a Genda Genda fool. I'm not sure about the actual name in English. I don't remember exactly, but in Hindi it's it's supposed to be a Gendika fool. So that color, you know, that 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 has a specific color. That type of yellow color is known as a canary yellow color. So it's going to form eventually a canary yellow PPT, which is a very very distinguishable color. Okay, so that detects the presence of phosphorus. What about the reaction in that particular case? So this H3PO4 when reacts with ammonium molybdate which is NH4 twice MOO4. It's going to form a PPT which is NH4 thrice PO4 then 12 MOO3 which is known as ammonium phosphomolybdate. Ammonium phosphomolybdate and it is actually yellow in color. Canary yellow in color or you can say orangish yellow in color. Okay, so that presence actually uh, detects the the uh, the actual presence of a phosphorus in the initial organic compound. I hope the entire part related to the detection of different type of uh, hydroatoms in case of organic compound is clear to everyone. That is all about the basic analysis of <clears throat> your first part, which is qualitative analysis. So we have discussed about the presence of a carbon, nitrogen, uh, sulfur, halogen as well as phosphorus. This entire part is now done. Okay. <coughs> so you just have to uh, note down each and every point. So I'm not talking about the entire theory analysis that I'm going to give you that uh, process. What are the steps in that particular case? Just note down each and everything because this entire part is very important and you can find at least one question is going to be asked directly from this entire part. And if you know the exact test, you will be able to answer the, the, the actual question correctly. Okay. So this is the first part, okay? <clears throat> okay, now let's talk about the next portion which is the quantitative estimation. Quantitative estimation is a very, very interesting because in that particular case, I want to talk about the mass percentage which is actually present in the organic compound. So let's say I have W gram of organic compound. How much percentage of carbon and how much percentage of hydrogen is present in the organic compound? That is basically the quantitative estimation. So first of all, I am talking about the simple hydrocarbon which corresponds to carbon and hydrogen only. So if I talk about the estimation of carbon and hydrogen, they are going to be estimated in a single experiment, which generally is related to the eudiometry experiment, if you know that particular part. So that entire portion is related to eudiometric experiments. What happens? First of all, <coughs> we have a known amount of organic compound, let's say, which is a W gram. It's going to be uh, reacted with excess amount of oxygen. It's going to be combusted with excess of oxygen. And eventually, you know that when carbon is uh, coming in contact with oxygen, it's going to be converted into CO2 and hydrogen is going to be converted into H2O. Now, with the help of a known amount of CO2 and H2O, which are going to be produced in the reaction, we can say that we have the desired amount or desired percentage of carbon and hydrogen in the initial organic compound. What happens in this particular case, if I talk about the setup, <coughs> you can see that we have the organic compound. It's going to be heated and then we are going to use the oxygen, source of oxygen, which is going to be provided. Now, in this heating condition, when this oxygen is being provided, carbon is going to be converted into CO2 <coughs> and hydrogen is going to be converted into H2O. It's going to be passed through a copper oxide pellet to settle down whatever impurities we have. And rest part is basically we have anhydrous CaCl2. This anhydrous CaCl2 has a tendency to capture water. So you can initially weigh the amount of this U-shaped tube which contains only anhydrous CaCl2 and you can uh, weigh the actual part of KOH solution in the next tube. After the reaction, after the completion of reaction, again you have to weigh the uh, this CaCl2 U-shaped tube because the amount is going to be changed. You know that uh, if I talk about the H2O, it's going to be absorbed by CaCl2, first part. So definitely if water is being produced, it's going to be absorbed by the entire part of anhydrous CaCl2. It has more affinity with water. 
So amount of this, the, the weight of this entire part, this U-shaped tube is going to change. After the experiment, you, again, you have to weigh. So whatever difference you have in the initial and final weight, you can say that must be the amount of H2O being absorbed. Initially, you have uh, <coughs> actually uh, checked the weight of that U-shaped tube containing KOH solution. What happens that KOH being basic in nature and CO2 being acidic in nature, they both are going to react together and they are going to form K2CO3. So basically, KOH has a uh, affinity towards CO2. It's going to absorb the entire amount of CO2. And if CO2 is being absorbed, the weight of this U-shaped tube is again going to change and you can weigh uh, after the completion of reaction and you can check the difference between the initial and final weight. Whatever difference you have, that will be the amount of H2, uh, CO2 being absorbed in this, in this particular uh, tube. I hope this part is clear. So, you know, initially, you know the amount of CO2 being absorbed, you know the amount of H2O being absorbed and initially whatever amount you have taken for the organic compound, that part is already known. So whenever you are dealing with the questions of estimation of carbon and hydrogen, you just have to look for three informations. First one is the weight of organic compound. You have to look for the weight of organic compound. Second part, you have to look for the weight of CO2 produced. And third part, you have to look for the weight of H2O produced. These three parts are always going to be given to you. I hope this part is clear. I hope this entire part is clear. What happens in the experiment? Just don't look at the experiment. If I talk about the uh, basic reaction, I know we have the organic compound which is let's say H, uh, CXHY because I don't know the exact formula of the organic compound. It's going to be reacted with excess amount of oxygen and eventually it's going to be converted into CO2 as well as H2O. I hope this part is clear. I hope this part is clear. There is no need to balance this equation. There is no need to balance this equation. Now, let's say that this W of a CO2 is already given, which is, let's say, A gram. This W of H2O is also given, which is, let's say, B gram. And this W of organic compound is also given, which is, let's say, X gram. Let's say, let's say, this entire part is given. If somebody asks you, what is the percentage of a carbon and percentage of hydrogen? What you are going to use? What you are going to use in the calculation? You can say that uh, mass percentage of a carbon in a sample in a sample will be weight of carbon in organic compound divided by total weight of organic compound multiplied by 100 definitely you are going to use this calculation and you can also say that the percentage of hydrogen in a sample will be like that that weight of hydrogen in organic compound divided by total weight of organic compound multiplied by 100 because you are calculating the mass percentage now the thing is that the total weight of organic compound is already given so you have to calculate these two amounts. How to deal with that particular part? Very easy. Very, very easy. So first of all, you know that we have 44 gram of CO2. Molar mass of CO2 is 44 gram. 12 for carbon, 16 for oxygen multiplied by 2 because we have 2 oxygen. So if I talk about the 44 gram of CO2, it actually contains 12 gram of carbon from the molar mass calculation. Can I say that 1 gram CO2 will contain how many grams? 12 by 44 gram of carbon. And whatever amount of this CO2 is being produced, so you can say that a gram CO2 is going to produce 12 by 44 multiplied by a gram of carbon. So you know that in the organic compound, the amount of carbon is 12 by 44 multiplied by a. So you can put this value here and you can calculate the percentage of carbon. In the same way, in the same way, for H2O, same calculation, that we have 18 grams of H2O, molar mass of H2O is 18 gram, 2 for hydrogen, 16 for oxygen. It actually contains 2 grams of hydrogen. 
सो आई कैन से वन ग्राम एच टू ओ विल कंटेन टू डिवाइडेड बाय एटीन ग्राम ऑफ हाइड्रोजन सो इवेंचुअली इफ द डेटा इज गिवन दैट बी ग्राम एच टू ओ इज बीइंग प्रोड्यूस यू कैन से दैट बी ग्राम एच टू ओ विल प्रोड्यूस टू बाय एटीन मल्टीप्लाइड बाय बी ग्राम ऑफ हाइड्रोजन दैट्स इट You know the amount of hydrogen which is present in the organic compound. You know the total weight of organic compound multiplied by hundred. That will be your answer. I hope this part is clear. Just note down this important calculation. And if eventually, if you want a simpler version, you can say that the percentage of carbon will be equal to twelve multiplied by the weight of a CO two being produced. Divided by forty-four, multiplied by the weight of organic compound given, multiplied by hundred. Same for hydrogen. Two multiplied by weight of H two O being produced, <coughs> divided by eighteen, multiplied by W, which is the weight of organic compound, multiplied by hundred. And that is the calculation. And this method is actually known as Liebig methods. This entire method. is actually known as leibig's method i hope this portion is clear i hope this portion is clear so let's talk about a very simple question question says that on complete combustion 0.246 g of an organic compound so first of all the data is given that w of organic compound is given which is 0.246 g give 0.198 g of carbon dioxide so w of co2 is also given Which is zero point one nine eight gram, and W of H two O is also given, which is zero point one zero one four gram. Rest part is very easy. You just have to put the entire values in a single formula. <clears throat> so first of all, if I am talking about the percentage of carbon, I can say it must be twelve by forty four. multiplied by w of co2 divided by w of organic compound multiplied by 100 so i can say that will be 12 divided by 44 multiplied by <coughs> 0.246 sorry 0.198 divided by 0.246 multiplied by 100 <coughs> you just have to solve this entire part and let me know the final answer that will be the percentage of carbon in the same way if i talk about the next part if i talk about the next part which is percentage of hydrogen i can say it must be 2 uh, by 18 multiplied by w of h2o divided by w of organic compound multiplied by 100 that's it so i can say that will be 2 divided by 18 multiplied by w of h2o which is 0.1014 divided by 0.246 multiplied by 100% so just try to calculate this entire part and let me know the final answer so that's how you can deal with this entire part i told you three informations are going to be given in the question and you have to use this simple formula okay is that clear to everyone <coughs> okay next part if i talk about the estimation of a nitrogen in that case we have basically two methods first one is actually known as a dumas method and next one is actually known as a zeldals method and both the methods are actually very very important in the case of nitrogen estimation both the methods are very important so first of all if i talk about the dumas method so in this method the organic compound is heated with copper oxide strongly what happens carbon hydrogen and sulfur which are oxidized to co2 h2o and so2 respectively while the nitrogen is set free so i am using copper oxide to convert the entire part into gaseous state so that they are not going to interfere with the test i can remove co2 i can remove h2o i can remove even so2 and only part which is set free will be nitrogen now these gases are passed through a nitrometer containing 30% koh solution if co2 is there definitely koh is going to absorb this entire part koh is basic so definitely it's going to absorb so2 also and water is not going to hinder with anything so nitrogen will be directly passed to nitrometer to check the amount of nitrogen being produced i hope this part is clear i hope this first part is clear what is the actual course of reaction what happens that carbon dioxide and sulfur dioxide are absorbed and steam condenses 
सो दीज आर बेसिक इन नेचर दीज आर एसिडिक इन नेचर बोथ कार्बन डाइऑक्साइड एंड सल्फर डाइऑक्साइड बोथ आर एसिडिक इन नेचर एंड दे आर गोइंग टू बी एब्सॉर्ब इन के ओ एच बिकॉज इट इज बेसिक इन नेचर एंड स्टीम वॉट एवर एच टू इज बींग प्रोड्यूस इज गोइंग टू बी कंडेंस एंड नाइट्रोजन इज कलेक्टेड बाय द डिस्प्लेसमेंट ऑफ अ के ओ एच सोल्यूशन फ्रॉम द वॉल्यूम ऑफ द कलेक्टेड नाइट्रोजन द परसेंटेज ऑफ नाइट्रोजन इज बींग कैलकुलेटेड आई होप दिस पार्ट इज क्लियर सो इवेंचुअली यू कैन सी इफ वी हैव सी एक्स एच वाई एन जेड इज गोइंग टू बी रिएक्टेड विद कॉपर ऑक्साइड एंड इवेंचुअली सीओ टू इज गोइंग टू बी फॉर्म एच टू इज गोइंग टू बी फॉर्म एन टू इज गोइंग टू बी फॉर्म एंड कॉपर इज सेट फ्री I hope this part is clear. This is the first portion related to a very basic method, which is known as Dumas method. Okay, I hope this part is clear. Okay, moving forward, let's say the mass of organic compound is already given, which is m gram. So initially, what you can uh, do you just have to look for the information which is given in the question so m gram of uh, organic compound is given <coughs> volume of nitrogen is being collected nitrogen is a gas so definitely all the properties related to gaseous state are going to be given so let's say let's say that v1 ml is initially being collected at room temperature which is let's say t1 kelvin so i have to use the gaseous equations in that particular case so volume of nitrogen at stp will be very easily calculated because we know our simple uh, analysis uh, p1 v1 upon t1 will be equal to p2 v2 upon t2 let's say this is the part where i am talking about the stp this is the part which is given conditions this is the part for the given conditions okay so i can say that at stp everything is known to us we know that uh, at stp the pressure is supposed to be 180 m and temperature is supposed to be 273 kelvin but the entire part is being collected at a temperature which is t1 <clears throat> so how can you correlate you can say that p which is 180 m multiplied by v at stp which we don't know divided by pv upon t1 which is 273 is being equal to p2 v2 upon t2 okay now after uh, the entire calculation this uh, t2 is given to us which is the room temperature let's say this uh, t2 is given to us so i can say that volume uh, uh, at stp at stp will be equal to p2 v2 multiplied by 273 Divided by divided by T two multiplied by one V at STP uh, volume of nitrogen which is being collected at STP. Okay, now P two whatever value is given you have to put the value <coughs> volume whatever being uh, collected at the uh, uh, conditions multiplied by two seventy three divided by whatever temperature is given. So in this particular case, I am considering the pressure is given as a P one, volume is given which is being collected as V one, and the temperature is a T one. So you can see both the calculations are same. Now, if I want to convert the entire data one eighty m, it may be seven sixty mm of mercury. So you can do that particular part, and that's how you can deal with the entire analysis. So this is the volume of nitrogen being collected at STP. I hope this part is clear. I hope this first portion is clear. okay this is the simple part which is the equation of state when pressure volume and temperature everything is variable then you can use a p1 v1 upon t1 will be equal to p2 v2 upon t2 okay now what happens where p1 and v1 are the pressures and volume of the nitrogen p1 is a different from the atmospheric pressure definitely because at uh, uh, stp the pressure is definitely going to be 760 mm of mercury or 180 m okay now p1 is basically atmospheric pressure minus aqueous tension so definitely the entire part is being collected over a liquid so there might be an aqueous tension so if i am removing that particular part then i can say i am uh, i am getting the actual pressure exerted by the uh, nitrogen gas which is present in the container now we know that uh, <coughs> uh, for one mole of the gas one mole means we have 22.4 liter at stp one mole of the gas actually weighs equals to the molar mass because there is a formula that number of moles equals to volume of gas at stp divided by 22.4 
सो इफ दिस एन इज वन फॉर वन मोल आई कैन से वॉल्यूम ऑफ द गैस एट एस टी पी इज गोइंग टू बी ट्वेंटी टू पॉइंट फोर लीटर एंड इफ आई से दैट नंबर ऑफ मोल्स विल बी इक्वल टू गिवन वेट डिवाइडेड बाय मोलर मास इफ आई एम टॉकिंग अबाउट दी वन मोल आई कैन से डब्ल्यू ऑफ एन टू विल बी इक्वल टू ट्वेंटी एट ग्राम पर मोल it means 28 gram per mole which is a one mole of nitrogen gas means that the volume at stp is supposed to be 22.4 liter so how can we talk about the amount in that particular gas we know that this much amount ml weighs 28 gram so this volume which is v uh, volume which we have already calculated that much volume actually contains how much gram of nitrogen you can calculate so v ml of n2 at stp actually weighs 28 multiplied by v divided by 22 400 that must be in grams so you have calculated the amount of nitrogen divide the amount of nitrogen with the total amount of organic compound which must be m because initially we have taken m and if you multiply the entire part with 100 you can easily calculate the percentage of nitrogen you have to only remember the final formula you just have to remember the final formula that's it and that's how you can deal with the calculation accordance with the dumas method i hope this part is clear i hope this part is clear i hope this part is clear and that's how you can deal with the calculation <coughs> in accordance with the dumas method just have a look at it just note down each and everything and uh, try to solve at least one or two question okay just give me a minute i hope now i'm audible to everyone okay and that's how you can actually estimate the amount of nitrogen in the organic compound now let's talk about the next process in that particular scenario if i talk about the next process uh, you can uh, like practice this question for the calculation of the uh, entire part related to nitrogen with respect to dumas method if you find any difficulty just let me know it's a very easy question it's a very very easy question okay now let's talk about the next part which is related to the estimation of uh, halogens estimation of halogen estimation of sulfur estimation of uh, phosphorus they actually occur with the help of same process or same method which is known as carius method so basically the percentage composition of halogen sulfur as well as phosphorus present in the organic compound is determined with the help of carius method remember this method is almost same but the chemicals which are being used in the entire calculation part they might differ so if i talk about the first part the principle is a very easy that we have initially a tube a glass tube which is 50 cm long that tube is actually known as a carius tube so a known mass of the organic substance is heated with a fuming nitric acid and a few crystals of a silver nitrate in the sealed hard glass tube about 2 cm wide and 50 cm long which is known as carius tube now this estimation is only for halogens because we are using silver nitrate and the reactions you already know so if we have anything which is x negative eventually it's going to be reacted with agno3 and definitely it's going to form agx now we can calculate the amount of x with the help of agx being formed and rest of the part is just like the uh, liebig's method which is the calculation of carbon and hydrogen so if i talk about the first part that carbon and hydrogen are going to be oxidized to co2 and h2o because we are using nitric acid which is a good oxidizing agent while halogen is converted into silver halide what happens so let's say we have a carbon we have hydrogen and we have a halide ion i am using hno3 concentrated and i'm also using ag no3 aqueous solution what happens that is the entire part will be converted into co2 being removed h2o is not going to interfere with the reaction and a ppd of agx is being formed 
so you can wash this ppt you can dry this ppt and calculate the weight of this ppt being produced in the reaction so what happens the precipitate of silver halide are filtered washed dried and weighed knowing the mass of the substance initially taken because we always know how much amount of organic compound we have taken initially and the mass of precipitate being formed the percentage of halogen can be easily calculated so there are three things either you can form agcl or you can form agbr or you can form agi calculation is very very easy so if i talk about the first part first of all the molar mass of agcl is going to be 108 for this part uh, silver cl is 35.5 so it should be 143.5 gram per mole for agbr the molar mass of agbr is supposed to be ag is 108 br is 80 so it should be 188 gram per mole in this case the molar mass of agi is supposed to be 108 for uh, basically your silver and 127 is for iodine so 127 plus 8 uh, should be uh, 135 235 so it's going to be 235 gram per mole why i'm using this calculation because it will give you the idea what's going to happen next so let's say that uh, in first method let's say first method first part is for agcl first part is for agcl you can see the given information you can see the given information which is w gram of organic compound is being produced and uh, x amount of let's say x amount of agcl is being produced okay or you can say that must be m gram m gram of agcl is being produced so you can say that 143.5 gram agcl contains 35.5 gram of cl it means 1 gram agcl will contain 35.5 divided by 143.5 gram cl so you can say that uh, m gram of agcl will contain 35.5 divided by 143.5 multiplied by m gram of cl now rest part is very easy you have calculated the amount here so you can say that percentage of chlorine will be equal to given amount of chlorine in the organic compound which is supposed to be 35.5 divided by 143.5 multiplied by m of agcl divided by w of organic compound multiplied by 100 now if you are doing the same process for agbr as well as agi you just have to change the formula a little bit so percentage of bromine you can say is going to be weight of bromine is 80 divided by molar mass should be 188 multiplied by grams of agbr given divided by w of organic compound multiplied by 100 in the same way if i talk about the percentage of iodine this must be weight of iodine divided by 235 multiplied by m of agi divided by w of organic compound multiplied by 100 and that's how you can calculate the entire part very easy so for simplicity i have given the formula here you can just refer to the same formula okay i hope this entire part is clear i hope this entire part is clear now if i talk about the next part you can solve one question like this uh, and let me know the answer uh, same one more question is given for the calculation for the carious method now in case of sulfur in case of sulfur i am again going to use the same condition i am going to use an oxidizing agent so that we can uh, remove co2 and h2o and i am using a specific reagent for uh, sulfur so first of all if i am using a nitric acid solution 
what happens that whatever sulfur is present it's going to be converted into so4 to negative it's going to be converted into sulfate and i'm going to use a solution of barium chloride bacl2 because it's going to form a ppt of baso4 so every time reaction is almost same i'm using different type of reagent so a known mass of organic compound is heated in presence of a, a sodium peroxide or fuming nitric acid oxidizing agent and sulfur present in the compound is oxidized to sulfuric acid because we have the acidic solution definitely this so4 2 negative is going to combine with h positive to convert into h2so4 basically we need sulfate ion and it is precipitated as a barium sulfate by adding an excess of a barium chloride solution in water now calculation is going to remain as it is just look at the formula it's going to remain as it is so the precipitate is filtered washed dried and weighed the percentage of uh, uh, sulfur can be calculated from the mass of barium sulfate and eventually you can see the percentage of sulfur is basically the amount of sulfur which is present in barium sulfate divided by the molar mass of barium sulfate which is 233 multiplied by the mass of baso4 which is being produced in the reaction that should be given divided by the molar mass uh, the mass of organic compound initially taken multiplied by 100 exactly same exactly same okay and if i talk about the last part if i talk about the last part this test we already know this test we already know that we are talking about the estimation of a phosphorus i'm going to use the same type of test i'm using the oxidizing agent either uh, sodium peroxide or hydrogen peroxide or fuming nitric acid because i need to convert whatever phosphorus we have whatever phosphorus we have i need to convert that entire part into phosphate ion so that it can react with ammonium molybdate I am going to use the same type of reagent, ammonium molybdate, and eventually it's going to be converted into uh, so, uh, ammonium phosphomolybdate. It's going to form a PPT which is ammonium phosphomolybdate. Formula is again going to be same. If I talk about the molar mass of ammonium phosphomolybdate, it is 1877 and the amount of phosphorus is only 1. 1 phosphorus means 31 gram. So the data should be given is weight of organic compound which is M and the weight of ammonium phosphomolybdate which is being produced in the reaction which is M1 gram. Again apply the same formula, same, uh, same formula just like the Karius method. It means the percentage of a phosphorus will be amount of phosphorus, molar mass of phosphorus which is 31 divided by the molar mass of ammonium phosphomolybdate multiplied by the amount of ammonium phosphomolybdate which is being produced divided by the weight of organic compound multiplied by the 100. So again, again you are going to get a same type of formulation. You can also use another method. You can use also another method. You can produce Mg2P2O7 by reacting with a different reagent. Again, the formula is going to remain same. Again, the formula is going to remain same. Because this has a 2 phosphorus, it means now molar mass becomes 62, 31 multiplied by 2. Divide by the molar mass of this Mg2P2O7, which should be 222. Multiplied by the amount of Mg2P2O7 formed in the reaction. Divided by the mass of organic compound initially taken multiplied by 100. And that's how you can deal with quantitative analysis of each and every element. Now, I may suggest you to practice at least uh, two to three questions related to each and every part because the questions are going to remain same as it is. They are uh, like only the data is going to change, but the entire process is going to remain same. Uh, and that is the complete analysis of your portion, which is purification and estimation of the organic compound. Okay. So I hope the entire part related to this estimation is clear to everyone. If anybody found, uh, find any difficulty while doing the calculations, just let me know in the comment box so that, uh, we can discuss the entire part in the next session. Okay. So that's all from my side. Thank you so much.